Hi everyone. So there are uh, several questions that have been asked around self-regulation and how to do what before how. So I thought I would just take each question and give as quick of an answer as I can. I don't know, probably won't be quick, but let's see. I've got them printed out. So question number one, um, is the self-regulation rubric that was shared um, and we had done an example for a five-year-old. Um, is that example the same for all ages? So the self-regulation rubric, there's a set of directions that comes with it, and it sort of explains how it's organized. And so generally speaking, there are five columns and five rows. So each column is a year of development, plus or minus. So one year, two year, three year, four year, five year old. But the five-year-old is the whole year of being five. So it's really five to six. Um, the older children are, the more development becomes variable. So you may have a five-year-old who is still doing things that are in the four-year-old column or the fourth column or even the third column. And we would still consider that perhaps on track. It wouldn't be a strength for a five-year-old to be doing those earlier skills, but it wouldn't be atypical either. So there's a bit of a distinction there. So you need to make sure that you are using the ages, the years in columns, but also thinking about has this child lived much of their life in the green zone? Uh, do they have a different pattern when they're in the green versus not in the green? So you can have a child who has the skills, but when they're in the red or the blue, they can't demonstrate them. So just know that, yes, the rubric is from birth through about six years of age, that there's really only some face validity to the items, meaning I took a whole bunch of research and other assessment tools and took what they were saying about when these skills emerged in human development and categorized them into five columns that are roughly one year of age each. Secondarily, we have to know that as children get older, development becomes more variable. So we wouldn't be surprised to see a child in more than one column, especially if they're older. And then thirdly, we need to think about how much time the child has spent in the green zone for the past five years or for, for the past four years. And really think about, do they look different in terms of skills and strengths when they're in the green versus when their flip, lid has flipped and now we have to offer a lifeline. So hopefully that answers question number one. Question number two, uh, can I share some of the benefits of having strong executive functioning skills so that you can create some buy-in? So the biggest thing here is that you need to look at the research that shows the concurrent nature of early development. So one of the first places is to check out the Pre-K Teach and Play Podcast 29, where I talk to the authors of Stop, Think, Act, and we talk about how relate, uh, early development is happening concurrently. So for example, people think about what's a predictor of um, early literacy skills um, and literacy mastery, and really it's skills early on in mathematics is one of the biggest predictors of how well you will read later. When you peel that back and go, why is math so predictive of literacy, there's very uh, strong ties back to executive functioning or self-regulation skills. So the ability to stop, think, act really shows up in early math skills and then is highly related to literacy skills. So you need to look at the concurrentness of development. You need to look at whole child all of the research that shows that all these things are bi-relational, that as one increases, so does the other, versus looking in silos. And then the last part of that buy-in is understanding that regardless, without strong relationships, children can't learn any skills. So we need to really understand and believe that relationships are the active ingredient and not look at literacy, math, science, social emotional, but really say, huh, do we have a strong relationship with this child? Are we attuned to them? Then are we looking holistically, concurrently 
bi-relationally. So I'll give you links to several resources that you can read um, and articles that you can share, but really thinking about how development is happening concurrently, whole child, and relationship is really where you have to start the conversation to get buy-in and or help people see how social, emotional, health, and well-being is intricately tied to academic skills. We don't want to say that one comes before the other or that one is more important. So just like I wouldn't say literacy is more important than social, emotional, I also wouldn't say social, emotional is more important than literacy. They are bi-relational. If one is low, the other will be low. And so we got to look at whole child within the context of relationships. Okay. Anybody still with me? Question number three. How do we help children use strategies in the moment? So let's say we've pre-taught how to stay in the green zone, things that'll help you regulate, ways to stop, think, act, but now we're becoming dysregulated. Or worse yet, we flipped our lid and we're now in the red or the blue zone. So how do we help kids apply those strategies when they become dysregulated? All right, this is hard guys because you can only use the strategies when you're in the green and you're like, but that doesn't make any sense. I need them when I'm in the red or the blue. Mm. Okay, best thing you can do is when the child is noticing that they are becoming hyper or hypo aroused, that they can use the strategy, the coping strategy to put the brakes on they are gonna rely heavily on us, the environment, and initially really some coping um, mechanisms to get them by how to put those brakes on. Once the lid has flipped, once the child has become so dysregulated, so hyper aroused or hypo aroused, when their body has become overstressed or flooded, these are all different ways to say the same thing, there really isn't any tapping back to the strategy for staying in the green zone. It's too late. So that's why we say your job has changed and now the only thing we can do is bring the body back into homeostasis, back to feeling calm and enjoying calm, back to a more neutral state where they can then apply the strategy to stay there. So it's a dance. And when we say bring the child back into the green, we don't mean go from 60 back to, you know, flat line good. It might just be 55. So 55 is the top of the green. 60 is too much. All we're doing when we say we're offering a lifeline is something that will bring them back to 55. Then we remind them of the strategy, the coping strategy, the way to stay in the green, and we hope they can apply it. So it's not about generalizing and it's not about using it in the moment. The only using it in the moment is awareness that I'm about to leave the green zone. So I've become so close to my tipping point or so close to being shut down that I can put the brakes on. So our only chance is just to catch that before we actually end up in the red or blue. If we end up in the red or blue, our only opportunity at that point is to throw out anything we've pre-taught, anything that has to do with self-regulating, and we're asking them to actually come back. Now, if you're thinking, oh, well, self-regulation is deep breathing, so I want them to breathe deeply. Yes, but you can only breathe deeply if you have a conscious awareness that now would be a time that breathing would be helpful. So just like we say, you can't say to people, calm down and, oh yeah, oh sure, I'll calm down. Or like I always say, like my mom says, drive safely. Well, it's a good thing you told me that because I wouldn't have driven safely if you wouldn't have reminded me that, right? But in the moment when I got a little bit sleepy while I was driving, the weather turned poor, that's not the time to remind me to put my hands at 10 and 2 and to stay alert, right? It's too late. So now all I can do is try to get myself back into safety, then remember, right, I need to stay awake, roll down my window. Oh, I need to 
be more alert, turn off the radio, but I can't do that when my car is skidding out of control. I don't know if that helps, okay? So it's not about generalizing or using them or putting them into practice functionally unless it is something that puts the brakes on. So maybe what you're really needing to figure out are what are coping strategies and what are lifelines that actually put the brakes on. So they're not something that's designed necessarily to bring you back, but to keep you from going over the edge. Okay, then there was some information about uh, questions around collecting data on the rubric and maybe collecting that data in the Teaching Strategies Gold system so that you can monitor it and graph it and even score some of the items in the TS Gold that are around social emotional health and well being. So here's the kind of rub, guys. Um, TS Gold or any other curriculum based assessment is really a broad based assessment. It's a broad stroke. It's a big look at development. So if you're like, I wish it would break it down. Well, the minute it breaks it down, you're like, I wish there weren't so many items. So all we can do is say, I'm looking at the TS Gold to give me large baseline of where to begin. Is this a common outcome that children are doing okay with? Okay enough. Are the children outside of their color zone so much that they are struggling and we need to do something different? Or are they so far away from what I expect developmentally that I have to keep peeling back and finding a different what? But really the TS Gold is there to design to track progress on common outcomes at big points in time, beginning of the year, middle of the year, towards the end of the year. It's not really meant to do performance monitoring, certainly on a day-to-day, -day, week to week, or even month-to-month -month basis. So if you have a child who's struggling with letter identification, social emotional, language, I don't care which item on the TS Gold. If you have a child who's struggling, you really need to step outside of TS Gold and find a different what could be an earlier item in the TS Gold, but because of how it's developed, it'll be unlikely that you'll find a consistent way to find the um, what's your what from the Gold. So you just need to understand that your data from the Gold is saying, ha, we are not teaching a common outcome here. We are really in that messy middle or we need to go to a foundational. You need some other go-to resources, other scopes and sequences that tell you when I'm struggling with literacy, let's say it's phonological awareness. When I'm struggling with math, let's say it's one-to-one -one counting. When I'm struggling with getting my wants and needs met in appropriate ways. Whatever it is, once you've got data from the TS Gold that the child is struggling, you need to step outside of the Gold and use some other go-to resources like the rubric uh, for self-regulation. I also have one for play, one for writing. You can use the AEPS, you can use the certs, you can use my blog on um, the crystal ball resources that gives you tons of go-to scope and sequence resources but you need some really go-to uh, developmental milestones that break it down, track progress on that peeled back skill, then when it's time to do TS Gold again, see if that work that you did in a more concentrated way has moved the bar on those common outcomes of phonological awareness, of counting, of getting needs met, versus wanting the TS Gold to break every skill down and then tracking progress back to the common outcome. The TS Gold is really there for you when you're at the common outcome level. Once you've left that bottom tier and you've moved into the messy middle or a foundational skill, you have to go to other scope and sequence. Okay, how do we regulate our own behavior when students are struggling to stay in the green zone? I'll give you some links to this. There's actually a parallel track between what we do for children and what we do for adults. So if you have a co-teacher or you're a therapist or you're a coach and you're working with other adults, your job is exactly the same as a teacher's job with children, meaning you have to be attuned with them, in relationship with them. Your goal has to be, I'm gonna teach and support you, but if I see you escalating or de-escalating, I'm there as your coach, as your colleague, 
as your associate teacher to help put the brakes on. So whatever that coping strategy is to help put the brakes on. And we usually call that triggering the positive emotional attractor. Not a John Deere tractor, but a tractor like you're attracted to someone. And so we've got a lot of blogs on how do you trigger a positive emotional attractor or create that type of experience for someone? How do you help put the brakes on for when that adult is getting ready to flip their lid? But the same parallel track. If the adult is already in the red or in the blue, they're really operating from what we call a no-brain perspective. They're giving you behaviors that you find challenging. Your job changes. You're no longer their teacher, their therapist, their colleague, their coach. You're the boat captain. And your job is to offer them a lifeline back into the green to where you can then move forward. So... It's not an easy answer, but it's the same answer. So as you're working this through from teacher-child interactions, same thing, adult-to-adult interactions. Now the hardest one, yourself. You have to be there to throw yourself your own lifeline. So that's nearly impossible once your lid is flipped. You're going to say irrational things. You're going to not be able to think clearly. Um, Simple words may not come to mind. That's why we talk about shark music. So if you can hear your shark music getting so loud that you're about to lose it, that's you putting your own brakes on. Sometimes you will just flip your lid and then you will need to figure out how do you look around in your environment to put the lid back on. So we can spend a little bit more time talking about that, but I have some blogs, but just know that it's hardest on yourself because if there's no boat captain because you've jumped over and you're the boat captain, now the captain's in the water. There's not really someone left to let you out other than being able to literally let your system restore try not to be critical and judgmental of yourself and say ah i flipped my lid what can i do now moving forward but if you ruminate if you self-deprecate if you say oh i knew it i screwed up i'm terrible i'm not enough all you're doing is keeping yourself in the water and not letting your system restore. So anything that you can do that renews your system, restores the energy that it took to flip your lid, anything that gives you a sense of peace, calm, well-being, go for a walk, drink water, think a good thought, sit by somebody who loves you, hold someone's hand, get a hug, jump up and down, whatever it is for you that brings your body back into calm, into enjoying that space is what we talk about in terms of helping you regulate when a child's triggering your lid to flip. Okay, i uh, like to know more about ways to address the aspects of regulation that you feel a student is struggling with. So part of this is hard to answer because I need to know what your what is. So before you say to me, how can I address the aspects of regulation they're struggling with? I want to hear you talk to me about how did you figure out what the aspects were? Because if you're showing me, well, there's a little bit of attention, a little bit of regulation, a little bit of uh, problem solving, I'm going to say we're still all over the place. You need to look at your patterns and trends. You got to peel it back, peel it back and zoom in so that we're not working on too many things at once. Then once you know it's about impulse control, once you know that it's about um, being self-aware, once you know that it's about recall, once you know that it's about problem solving, literally it's Googling or going to Pinterest and looking up strategies to teach early problem solving to children. But until you know the behavior, you're kind of like out there all over or you're working on it globally. So I would love for you guys to think about when you think you've narrowed it down, take that thing you found and Google it and see if the search ends up something specific. If not, you probably haven't pared it down enough. You may also need good scope and sequence to really understand what comes later, what came earlier. So you're not just circling around going, huh, problem solving is a problem. 
What is the earliest form of problem solving? What does a baby do for problem solving so that you can really peel it back? Um, okay, last one. Understanding how to determine which self-regulation skills are underlying the difficulties we see for a particular student. To get to the root of the problem so that you know how to best support and give them the right interventions. So this is very much tied to what I was just talking about. Sometimes the root is lack of good, secure attachments. So one place I would invite you to go, if you don't know the work of Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson, is check out their work around um, the four S's. Is the child safe? Now, safety is a big thing, and there's work by Rick Hansen, Bruce Perry, um, a few others that are really talking about, Laura Fish, that talk about what do we mean, do you feel safe? But remember, that body is scanning. Am I safe? 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 So you can look at, is the child, uh, these four S's, do they feel safe? And that's emotional safety, physical safety. If not, that's where we start. Not a skill the child has to learn, but something we have to do to create uh, convince the child they are safe. The child also has to be seen. That's that validating. They're like, I need to know that you know that I'm here, that I'm having this big emotion, that I have a need, that I don't feel safe. So that attuned communication and attuned type of interaction. Soothe their nervous system. So how do I let them know that I am there? both in the green or when the lid is flipped? How do I become predictable? How do I become trustworthy? How do I become attuned with this child to where they want me to co-regulate for and with them? And that leads to the secure attachment, knowing that I'm safe through my interactions with you, knowing that you see me, through my interactions with you and knowing that you can soothe me through my interactions with you. So my invitation for uh, when you're feeling like, where is this coming from? What is the root of the problem? Why can't we get to it? I would say it's probably not yet really skill building. The child is definitely communicating that they need skills built across self-regulation, but we have to start with the four S's. Have we created in relations with this child Safety, being seen, being soothed, and a secure attachment. So, I hope that helps. I hope those are answers to the questions you were actually thinking of. Keep them coming. Ask again if something didn't make sense, and I'll put links to other things as well.